British Columbia has two systems of government, parliamentary and municipal. Parliament is rooted in law making, municipal in law keeping, legislative versus judicial. These forms are used around the world, but descend from the Kingdom of Wessex, of Alfred the Great who unified England. Wessex was divided into shires, governed by a shireeve, or sheriff, which retains its law and order connotation. Each shire was divided into hundreds, an area of 100 households. Each hundred had a court of property owners that met monthly. Each hundred court had a reeve to implement the court's decisions. Two knights of each hundred were called by the sheriff annually to set the farm or food rent from which our word comes. As population grew and towns evolved, so did the governance model. Our municipal governments come from the hundred court, a reeve with a council of property owners. Many British Columbian mayors were called reeves and the requirement for council members to own property only ended in 1973. The French invaded England and William the Conqueror laid siege to London, but his first legislative act granted it a charter of liberties in return for loyalty. Between his son King Henry I and Henry III, they raised money and weakened Shire landowners by granting hundreds of towns royal charters, making them boroughs. Towns might have fences, but borough meant settlement with a wall. Borough charters granted self-government, but most importantly, access to the royal courts, the heavy volume leading to our common law. A resident of a borough called a Burgess was a freeman with no feudal overlord. Boroughs had councillors, aldermen, and a reeve who kept the king's peace. Our city police reflect this tradition, not an arm of government as in the U.S. They maintain the king's or queen's peace, meaning subjects free to live their lives without harassment. For hundreds of years, England's government was conducted in French. Shire became county, borough, city, burgess, citizen, reeve, mayor. But a mayor continues to be addressed as a judge, your worship becoming your worship. When kings needed money, they called representatives, two knights from each shire, two burgesses from each borough. The gathering was called a parliament, from the French parler, to talk. In return for taxes, grievances were addressed through new laws. The three functions of parliament remain, to supply government with money, to make laws, and decide when a new parliament is needed. Before calling parliament, some monarchs would create boroughs to increase friendly votes. Other boroughs sent members to parliament, which monarchs in the House of Commons disputed. With the legal development of corporations, boroughs could incorporate with their own unique governance structures. Over the centuries, some boroughs became depopulated, yet still had two members of parliament while burgeoning industrial cities had none, and their elections excluded many citizens. Prime Minister Earl Grey overhauled parliamentary and municipal governance with reform acts, abolishing many boroughs and replacing their various structures with one municipal standard. The Baldwin Act granted incorporation to areas of at least 100 households, a reference to the ancient hundred, and granted broad powers which provinces would reduce later. Philosophers guided the evolution of Parliament. Aristotle and others recommended a balanced constitution of three parts, a traditional form rooted in history, an appointed council, and an elected assembly. This balanced constitution, our constitutional monarchy, was achieved in the glorious revolution. In Canada, this is our monarch, Senate, and House of Commons. Parliament has been designed to maintain a distribution of powers between the executive, legislative, and judicial. Despite the growth of municipal government, its design remains simple, a legislature or city council responsible for all three functions. 
our government systems have developed over a thousand years. Knowing this history can help us continue to evolve them.